It rained for 10 days and 10 nights straight after she went missing. It was a Sunday afternoon, May 27th, 1984. Eight-year-old Marjorie Christy Luna left home to go to the corner store only a few blocks away and never returned. Anybody that has a child and you like turn your back for a second and you can't find them, like you're at a store, you're home, or, and that feeling that, you know, going crazy, where, where is it? Imagine living that for 33 years. It's very hard. Christy disappeared around 2.30 p.m. that Sunday afternoon. It was Memorial Day weekend. She left her Green Acres home to get cat food for her newborn kittens, Boo Boo and Skeeter. The corner store she frequented, Belk's General Store, was only two blocks away from her house, exactly 400 feet away. It was a trip Christy made on a regular basis. And this is Belk's store, and Christy's house was right in here. You ready? Yeah. I'm Detective William Springer with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, Violent Crimes Division, Cold Case Unit. Uh, Christy Luna uh, was at home with her mother, Jenny, her sister, Allison, and uh, live-in boyfriend, Larry Jackson. They had taken a road trip the night before, had uh, went up to Central Florida, and came down uh, A1A and US-1 and stopped at uh, several parks on the way down, the last one being uh, Dubois Park. I was tired because I had driven all night, and Allison, my other daughter, was awake with me. Christy had slept, you know, part of the night. So she was wide awake, but I took her. She wanted Wendy's Happy Meal. So I took her over there and got her a Happy Meal and came back and decided I was going to lay down and rest, and so I put her on Yellow Submarine by the Beatles, that movie, cartoon movie, In the for her to watch. Where I was born, lived a man who sailed to sea, and he told us of his life in the land of so We had a, a mama kitty that had babies, and she thought she was hungry, so she decided to go to the little store, which is 400 feet from my front door little country town and um she made it there to get the cat food but she never made it back home jenny larry allison and christy all laid down to take a nap after they got something to eat uh, later in the afternoon christy got up and uh, told her mother that uh, she needed to go to the store to get cat food because they didn't have any cat food for their cat. Don't wait. But as you can see, <clears throat> right down here, you can see it from the corner is, is Belk's store. Your eye distance from the corner to the house and from the corner to Belk's store is eye distance. It's not it's not that far. Uh, Sunday afternoon, Memorial Day weekend. Back at a time when all the kids rode their bikes around the blocks, there was no cable TV, there wasn't internet, cell phones, you know, anything like that. Little Christy, only weighing 60 pounds, walked barefoot, wearing a turquoise jumpsuit and carrying a few empty plastic bottles she planned to exchange for money. A grocer remembers selling the cat food to Christy between 2.30 and 3 p.m. After calling a few of Christy's friends and knocking on a few doors, the police were notified at 10.15 p.m. that night and they have been searching for her ever since. Looking at 1984, no cell phones, no databases. The computer really wasn't a thing that everybody had back then. I don't even know if they even had computers. I mean, we had some. We had our computers that we used at work, but nothing like personal computers. 
So we had no databases. Everything we learned was through neighborhood canvases and just getting out and doing the footwork door to door. The case was first investigated by Detective Sergeant Dennis Connell of the Green Acres Police Department. He and his team of three detectives knocked on doors and interviewed over 50 people for two weeks straight. Most of those interviewed were children and adults who were in the neighborhood the day Christy vanished. With those interviews, Detective Connell learned Christy could have possibly stayed at the store till 6 p.m. playing arcade video games or even head out to a nearby park frequented by kids in the neighborhood. Days after the investigation began, the Green Acres Police Department realized they needed more resources to find Christie. That is when they called the FBI and the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. I was one of the original detectives on the case in 1984. Um, there was a supervisor, uh, John Kianka was the supervisor, and I want to say two other detectives, um, a Don Ugliano and a uh, Mark Bannon and myself worked on the case, along with the Green Acres detectives and the FBI agents. We had two suspects that were arrested for molesting Christie's best friend, who she was going to go see. Those two suspects were Charles and Willis Rambo. The Rambo brothers lived at 353 Broward Avenue only a few houses up from Christie's. There was a team assigned to interviewing Christie's friends, going to the elementary school, interviewing her friends at school, her teachers and things. Uh, during the course of that investigation, uh, one of Christie's closest friend was interviewed and it was discovered that uh, Willis and Chuck Rambo uh, were molesting her friend. Uh, this team put together a probable cause for the arrest of Chuck and Willis and a search for their house. Uh, it was established that Christie had gone to the Rambo residence. Um, Chuck and Willis were both interviewed and denied any involvement in the disappearance of Christie. A search was conducted of their house and their property, and no investigative leads could be developed as far as uh, Christie being murdered at that house. According to Ellen Belk, a clerk at Belk's store, she had seen Charles giving Christie money on one occasion at the store. A week later, Police charged the second Rambo brother, Willis, for sexual battery after the six-year-old girl told police Willis had also molested her and tried having sex with her one time. The judge working the case had a problem with the sexual battery charges against the Rambo brothers, stating the statements from the six-year-old girl would be inadmissible in court. The charges were dropped and the brothers pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of lewd assault. They were placed on probation for 10 years after serving a few months in jail. In 1993, Willis Rambo was sentenced to four life terms for sexually abusing his two stepdaughters. He is now serving life in a Florida prison. Charles, although arrested for molesting Christie's friend and convicted of lewd assault, was never registered as a sex offender. Prior to 1994, there was no federal law governing sex offender registration and notification in the United States. He now resides in Lenore City, Tennessee. But the Rambo brothers were not the only suspects in the case. Green Acres got information from Exeter, New Hampshire Police Department that a subject by the name of Victor Wynetti had been developed as a suspect in the disappearance of a girl in Exeter, Tammy Belanger. At that point, Green Acres and Exeter PD and the FBI were looking at Victor as a potential suspect in the disappearance of Christy Luna because he had relatives 
family, his parents, who lived um, not too far from the city of Green Acres. One Yeti was a golf course worker who moved to Florida from New Hampshire in 1984. He was reportedly at a party in Christie's neighborhood the day she disappeared, but moved to New Hampshire a short time after Christie went missing. When he moved back to Palm Beach, police from New Hampshire disclosed that inmates in a New Hampshire prison told him that one Yeti had confessed to abducting, raping, and then killing both Christie and Tammy back in 1984. When asked about it, one Yeti denied knowing Christie. He was sentenced to 75 years. Under the conditional release program Game Time, one Yeti was let out of prison in April 2012. Victor was released from prison, immediately moved to back to Palm Beach County. When he uh, moved to Palm Beach County, our TAC team did a 24-hour day surveillance on Victor for probably 30 days, and they photographed Victor looking in the windows of uh, various homes. It was established that the windows he was looking into were the bedrooms of minor children. They observed him standing outside these uh, bedroom windows masturbating. At that time he was arrested and charged with various uh, about crimes in, in Palm Beach County. And he was sent to prison. And finally got out of prison, I want to say 2009. Uh, once he got out, he was out of prison for probably a year, living in the Ocala area, and uh, subsequently died of natural causes. You got the Rambos, you got Victor Wynetti, and in 2010, uh, a William Ferris was arrested in Virginia for molesting uh, children. The problem with the case is, we don't know if she went directly to the store or not. She had a friend who lived on the street on the other side. And back in 1984, all this was open. There wasn't any fences. The <coughs> she could have left the house, walked this way, going to her friend's house. Now, her friend that day wasn't at home, which she was not aware of. But if she would have walked this way, there was a house back here, and there was no fences. This was all open. The house has been torn down. But in that house, back in 1984, William Ferris lived. William Ferris was arrested in 2010 in Virginia for child molestation. He's presently been sentenced to life. He's in a prison in Virginia. William Ferris denied in 2010 of knowing Christie. We re-interviewed him again, and he admitted to knowing Christie because his wife, back in 1984, babysat Christie's best friend. So <clears throat> he made statements according to his wife that when Christie and her friend, I'm not going to mention her friend's name, were together playing, he said, one of these days, one of these girls is going to disappear. After Christie disappeared, he made a statement that they'll never find her that she's off of Alligator Alley. Uh, William Ferris worked for the city of West Palm uh, and moved to Virginia within a year after the uh, murder of uh, her disappearance of Christie. It's discouraging when you can't come up with leads and you can't find out what happened to her. Um, because when you look at Jenny, and you have to place yourself in the idea of her daughter left home in 1984 
And to this day, she does not know what happened to her. Jenny has moved back into the house and has lived in the house that she lived in in 1984, hoping that if Christy ever came back, she'd know where to go home to. This, I'm hoping, goes out nationwide, and maybe somebody might uh, remember something that stood out in their mind back then, a neighbor who up and moved right away, changed cars, shaved their beard, got their hair cut, changed their appearance, uh, you know, did something that, you know, really stood out to them. I mean, you may think, well, I'm protecting somebody. But you have to realize that whoever you're protecting really doesn't deserve to be protected. I mean, this person has deprived and taken somebody and deprived Jenny of watching her daughter grow up her daughter get married, have kids, have a family, have grandkids. She's deprived Jenny of that. And then when you really think about it, she's deprived Christy of living a life of going to school, graduating high school, going to college, getting married, having kids. I mean, this person is a, and I used this before and I'll use it again, and you can cut it out, is a special kind of piece of because they have really destroyed not only Christie's life, but her mother's and her sister's life. And they've gone on with their life and enjoyed all this that they've deprived them of. And it's really uh, not fair. I mean, it's really not. And I mean, and if you want to keep concealing this person and lying for him and covering for him and thinking that you're doing the right thing, you're not. You're no better than that piece of shit because you're helping destroy Jenny's life and Allison's life because their life has been basically destroyed because of this one act by, by some perverted person. She was born just a ray of sunshine. She was so sweet, so tiny. And just always oh, such a good baby and smiling and everybody loved her. Bright, bubbly, a little mischief, but a lot of fun to be around. And we lived beneath the waves in our yellow submarine. We all lived in a yellow submarine, a yellow submarine, a yellow submarine. We all live in a yellow submarine, a yellow submarine, a yellow submarine, and our friends are all aboard. Many more of them live next door.